mainly in your slides. <laughs> All oh, right, cool. All right, I think we're go. So uh, welcome. Um, I'm George Wilson. I'm the IBM Linux Technology Center security team lead and security architect. And um, this is my colleague, Elaine Palmer. So I'm Elaine Palmer. I work in IBM Research in the security department. And I focus a lot on secure boot, particularly for our big mainframe systems. So today, we'd like to talk about establishing trust in Linux key rings. Is trust built in, imputed, or transitive? Standard disclaimer, Nina did a good job earlier of going through this, so I will not. So uh, the agenda, first we'll talk about some of the goals that we have. Then we'll give some background and definitions of some of the problems. Uh, we'd like to talk about trust sources in the Linux kernel, um, a bit about kernel keyrings, and then some recent activity. So the, um, the goal of the talk really is to share some of the things that we've learned uh, along the way, uh, because uh, neither Elaine nor I are keyring experts. Uh, we're um, not prolific contributors to the kernel, but we do use the keyring for various purposes. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, secure boot, uh, key management, um, uh, self-encrypting drives, there are various purposes we want to use it for. Um, and we'd like to just share some things that we've observed and encourage some discussion around some of those topics. So, what we're going to focus on is really the dot keyrings, the built-in kernel keyrings um, that are, are created and consumed internally by the kernel. Uh, you know, and notably, I mean, user space can't go really do a lot with the dot keyrings except uh, see what's there. Uh, what we won't cover uh, is other keyrings. You can use the keyring for a lot of things. We won't be talking about user space. Uh, we uh, will not be talking about TEEs or devices, and hopefully we can stay away from secure boot because we've talked about that a lot over the years. All right, so now some background defi definitions and problems. So trust is not a yes or no binary function, right? Um, either on or off. It's more of a stepwise function or a continuum. So I might trust highly uh, the firmware that boots my system, right? It's supplied by manufacturer, it's signed. Uh, I trust the manufacturer. Um, I might trust the kernel less. It's got more code, comes from different people. Um, uh, I might trust user space even less. It's a lot more code, comes from a lot more people. Um, may have different uh, certificates to verify its uh, authenticity. Um, or I could view it as a spectrum or, or continuum. Um, I might trust you know, uh, a, a, a distro certificate to verify my operating system, but I, I might not want to trust it for other things. So problem number one. If keys and business relationships aren't known at kernel build time, how do you establish trust later? Uh, and there are ways to do it, right? But that's, keep that problem in mind. Problem number two is it's difficult, if not impossible, upstream for machine owners and end users to load their own keys and sign their own modules. This changed in 5.18, but we have some criticisms of it and <coughs> some ideas for further improvements. But the, the situation is, is dramatically improved upstream. Distros had ways of doing this, right? But there wasn't a good upstream way of doing it. So 5.18 has got goodness in it. Um, problem number three is there's not a one-size-fits-all security model. Uh, a lockdown appliance kind of system is very constrained. Uh, you can control what goes uh, on inside of it. Um, you can even you know, uh, create uh, uh, policies that are very specific to, to the system and control your updates uh, in a very uh, constrained way. A general purpose system um, might need to get um, various uh, certificates to, to verify various pieces of the software. Um, in a circular economy, uh, you know, people may want to take the keys that, are, that exist on their machine, destroy them, and put somebody else's keys in their place. 
Uh, for critical infrastructure, you may require multiple signers. Uh, you you may, may want to test the kernel and packages before you put them into production and only permit those things to go into production. So we'd like to introduce uh, a new sort of term, um, and, and it'll be useful hopefully later in the talk, um, uh, to impute. So to impute is to attribute something to uh, another thing, right? Uh, so um, people impute wisdom to owls. Are owls wise? Mm, I don't know. People impute value to Bitcoin. Is it worth what you think it is? It maybe today, maybe not tomorrow. Uh, in, antique dealers impute value to antiques. Home buyers impute value to houses. House might not be worth what you think it is. Um, so we attribute value to things, but that, that value may not be accurate, justified, or in any way valid. So we want to apply this concept to trust. So sometimes we may want to trust things that are associated with particular you know, attributes that you know, someone or something has. So for instance, I trust the Acme baby formula company because they have a great reputation, right? Or I trust my stockholder's advice. He's a really personable person, seems really knowledgeable. Are those things true? Maybe so, maybe not. Maybe they're true for me, maybe they're not true for you. Uh, and this is versus transitive trust, where there is some trust relationship established up front, and then later that trust is extended to other things. Uh, so A trust B, B trust C, therefore uh, A trust C. So an example of this would be, you know, I, I trust my car dealer, had good service there. My car dealer trusts the parts supplier. Therefore, I am trusting the parts supplier to supply good parts. So then we'd like to talk about tr sources of trust in the kernel. Clarification. The kernel has to trust what it's told to trust. Um, decisions to add more keys are made solely within the kernel based on what it already trusts. That could either be a good thing, you could have Chaos Castle here, or you could have the Strong Fortress, depending on, on what that root of trust is and, 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 and how secure it actually is. Um, moreover, there's no uh, online connectivity, so you can't go check whether certificates are valid at boot time, generally. Uh, you can't go check uh, 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 for revocations with OCSP. Um, the, the kernel could be, uh, uh, you know, disconnected from the internet, it could be on a, on a you know, a, a military aircraft or something, or it could just have no network connectivity whatsoever, it could be a kiosk, right? So you, you can't go verify these certificates uh, at boot time, generally. So, um, there are three sources of trust in the Linux kernel we'd like to describe. So first of all, the built-in keys that are just, usually distros include these in, in the kernel image. Uh, and they're there, and they anchor trust for other things later, or that they can be used directly themselves. Uh, imputed uh, trust um, is, I, I want to trust something because I know where it came from, I trust the source, I want to bring it into the kernel. And it all depends on, on who or, or, or where it came from, the origin of it. And, and I, as an individual, need to make a determination whether or not to trust it. And then there's transitive trust, uh, where something that was built in or, or trusted uh, because it was imputed trust uh, is automatically trusted because the built-in or imputed thing signs it, right? So it depends on who's vouching for it, and that could be, once again, either good or bad. You could have Chaos Castle or, or Happy Castle there. So then we'd like to talk about kernel key rings. And with this, I will turn the talk over to Elaine. Thank you, George. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, let me have a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the machine owner keys or mock keys? Pretty good, OK. So um, we'll talk about a subset of keys within the kernel here, specifically asymmetric keys. So following these models of trust, 
The built-in keys, as George said, they're built into the kernel. Done at build time, there is an option where you can build your kernel with a space to put the keys and then fill in the keys and then sign the kernel. But essentially, they're still built in. And an example of that is the built-in trusted key ring. For the imputed trust model, um, in this case, um, keys are provided by the machine owner. It might be an administrator. Um, and in that case, the machine owner imputes trust to those keys. And samples of examples of that are platform key ring and the machine key ring. We'll get into those in a minute. And then for the model of transitive trust, so any key that's signed by a key that's already trusted and already in the kernel will be trusted also. So if a CA's key, a certificate authority's key is trusted, then everything signed by that CA will also be trusted. And an example of that is the secondary trusted key ring. All right, so let's go through some of these key rings. Um, <clears throat> This will go through some of the key rings as they were up through Linux 5.17. So starting with the easiest one, um, the built-in trusted keys key ring, um, what are those used for? They're used to ver keys on that key ring are used to verify other keys, kernel modules, and k-exec kernel images. And where do they come from? They're built in. So those are the easiest to follow. We add more keys. <clears throat> this is a secondary trusted key ring. The, those are used to verify other keys, kernel modules, and k-exec kernel images, just like the built-in keys. They are linked, the built-in and secondary key, trusted key rings are linked together. But adding a key onto the secondary trusted key ring has to be added using transitive trust. So you can't add one unless it's already been signed by something already on the secondary key ring or by something in the built-in key ring. All right, some more key rings. So the Dadaima key ring is, has a different set of keys in it. Those keys are used to verify k-exec kernel images. They're used to verify kernel modules. And different from the others, these are used to verify files. Part of the integrity subsystem will verify signatures and files. Um, so this is where it gets, IMA gets its keys from to do that verification. You notice it doesn't, does not verify other keys. So the buck stops there. The, IMA doesn't carry on with more keys. The way, how do the keys get into that key ring? Well, it uses the transitive trust model also. So in order to get a key onto the IMA key ring, it must be signed by something either on the built-in key ring or something on the secondary trusted key ring. Now, let's go to the bottom right with the blacklist. Blacklist is sometimes called a key ring, but it's not really a key ring. It doesn't hold keys. Um, what it's used for is to block files. So for example, if you're trying to check the signature on something and you want it to always fail, you can put that file digest into the blacklist. Um, or for certificates that you want to block, you put the to be signed field in the blacklist associated with that certificate. How does that get populated? Well, it can be built in. Some distros, for example, will use this as a way to revoke keys they can build in a revoke key in the blacklist. Or um, following the imputed trust model, um, keys that are in the UEFI um, uh, prohibit list, the DBX, or the mock DBX, or by root users adding things onto the blacklist, um, you, it follows both models, so built in and imputed. We have one more to talk about up through 5.17. And that's the platform key ring. And it's used for one and only one purpose. And that's to verify k-exec kernel images. That's it. Where do those come from? It follows the imputed trust model. 
And they come, those keys come from UEFI Secure Boot, from firmware, or machine owner keys. So far, so good? Yeah. All right. So let's talk about recent activity on these kernel key rings. So starting with 5.18, there's been um, an addition of a new key ring called the dot machine key ring. The purpose is it's, it's linked to the secondary key ring, and it does exactly the keys on the machine key ring have the broad usage as other keys on the secondary key ring, and meaning machine key, keys on the machine key ring are used to verify kernels or kernel modules or k-exec kernel images. Same, same authority, same powers. Um, they come from, they're using the imputed trust model. So you might have a system management system or your machine owner keys. Those are what are ported or pulled into the machine key ring. And that is controlled by, either, by a configuration variable and set at boot time. You'll notice this big gray box over here on the right um, where uh, the IMA key ring is disabled when the machine key ring is configured. And we'll go through that in just an, a minute. All right. So this new machine key ring has its advantages and its disadvantages. Way over the upper right, as George mentioned, the distros have needed this functionality for years. And they've been doing it through their own patches that they keep carrying year after year. Um, so this, the good thing is that this upstreams finally some of the functionality that's been carried for years. Um, the middle one, it's, it now supports the machine owner's authority to extend that trust. So if the machine owner wasn't involved in the build, then the machine owner now can have a say-so and extend their authority, for example, to kernel modules. Um, <clears throat> The middle bottom says we've got a flexibility now where we can have runtime additions to the secondary key ring with keys that have been added dynamically. And the bottom right is that there are controls on this machine key ring uh, so that it can be, um, whether or not it's even allowed is configured in at build time and whether it's enabled is set at um, boot time with through EFI variables. Those are the good things. And the bad side, there, the scope of this new machine key ring is really quite broad. And if we go back to um, Linus's some of his original requirements to talking about um, adding keys, his quote is, we want to enable machine owners to add their own keys and sign modules they trust. So if we go back a slide to the, the diagram here, what you'll see is that the machine key ring, because it has such a broad scope, it can do all of the things that anything else on the built-in trusted key ring. It's not restricted in any way. So it, it adds functionality that we need, but we think it goes too far. So, um, the, oh, the other thing is that um, the machine owner keys can be a large number of keys. We don't know the original source of them. And by loading all of them onto the machine key ring, um, there's no fine tuning of what goes on and what doesn't go on. So it's all or nothing. So what we would propose is that, as a slight variation on this, where what is loaded onto the machine key ring are only CA certificates that are in the machine owner key ring. And that, if we did that, then this picture changes so that the machine key ring has CA keys only. And it's still linked to the secondary key ring, but it's only got CA keys. And then we can enable um, the IMA key ring. And let's go through the positives and negatives for those. So, upper right. 
Um, by doing this, by separating the CA keys or certificate signing keys from code and data signing keys and those authorities, it encourages good key hygiene. If you go look in any kind of key management you know, book, you know that you, you really should restrict your usage of keys to either key signing or certificate signing or code signing or data signing or you know, TCP, whatever it is, network communications. It's best to restrict the usage of your key. So by having this restriction, we would say that anything on the machine key ring has to be a certificate signing key. Um, as far as separation of duties, going down a bit, um, in having IBM works a lot with the finance industry and they're dead set on keeping um, separation of duties. They must do that. And by doing it this way, we can support where an administrator or the owner of the machine is the one that loads the parent certificates, but is not involved in the code signing or the data signing or the or signing of more keys. So we support separating those duties. Um, the limiting the machine key ring, it has the same positive as the other where you can control it at build time and enable it at, at boot time. Um, and, oh, I missed one, where you can, um, by having two levels, a parent certificate and a child certificate or a key signing certificate and a code and data signing certificate, you can more frequently rotate the child certificates so that your machine owner controls the parent but the other keys can change at will and more frequently. Let's see. So um, I think we have I've gotten through the, the background and the proposal. Before we get into comments and questions, there are places that we've pulled this information from there in the slides. Um, on top of the references, we've had to um, tap the brains of um, Mimi Zohar, who's here in the audience, Nina, who spoke earlier, um, one of our certificate experts in IBM, and David Howells has an excellent video on um, video tutorial on key rings. And for getting the machine key ring code in and written and upstreamed, um, Eric Snowberg and Jarko Sakinen. So um, let's go back to questions and comments. Yes. Right. So the problem goes, oh, the question was, why is it that IMA is disabled when the machine, uh, the IMA key ring is disabled when the machine key ring is present? And that's a choice made um, by um, Mimi and others working on the uh, IMA subsystem. And the reason is that broad expansion of uh, scope from with the machine key ring, let me go back to this original picture. Originally, as it, or as it is written now in the kernel, the machine key ring has, everything on there has broad scope. It's as broad as everything on the secondary key ring. And what that would allow, for example, if you go to, let's say, your, a UEFI variable that gets loaded onto the machine key ring, because of that scope, it can end up linking to key, it can even be used to verify files in IMA. It's too broad. Right. The, Mimi, did you, sorry, the, the concern is that you're, what was, Yes, so let me repeat that. The concern is that by loading in the machine keys 
from anywhere or from this using this imputed trust then it will end up influencing what goes onto the IMA keyring, and that was unintended. Is anyone, is anyone here um, an expert on, for example, what restrictions we would want to request on those keys that go into the machine keyring. We know, for example, that it should be a CA equals true, and the key usage should be used to sign certificates, and both of those should be critical when you're parsing the certificate. But there might be other things that would be helpful, and perhaps uh, there's some opinions there. Yeah, we've thought about things like policy, right, to, to get some selectivity to the certificates that we're loading, right? And now that, that gives you something else that you got to go manage on your machine. Um, you know, is it, is it sufficient to control this through, you know, CA certs, you know, or, or is that not granular enough? And I think that's kind of one of our questions. Uh, I think there have been discussions of perhaps adding keyring policy in the past, but, but it, there's really no policy, you know, now other than just the, 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 the uh, signing relationships between things. So um, not advocating it necessarily, but, um, you know, that, that could give us uh, uh, the ability to, to say, I don't want these things. I want these uh, three of, of these eight things uh, on, on my uh, IMAC hearing. Not sure that's necessary or, or helpful, but. That's one of the thoughts that we had. We definitely want to do the separation, though, between the, the, the CA cert and the, the, the code signing certs. Um, just uh, they, they, you need uh, some way to go delegate changing those code signing certs easily. And, and CA certs facilitate that. So we think it was a mistake to, to allow you know, code signing certs there on the machine key ring. Which brings up something I didn't mention. <clears throat> the reason that this um, having two certificates is viewed on the negative side of this slide is because although it's a positive to have these two certificates, in common practice we found that um, often the code signing certificates are self-signed, they have the CA bid on, and they're used to sign code. So there's only one certificate. And asking um, to add two certificates in place of where one was used in common practice might not be well received. Question. Because um, making sure that a certificate, if you want to exclude these certificates, just make sure that it's 
Uh, uh, I should try to summarize that for the recording, <laughs> but <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> I, I think, let's see, in summary, that more granular control is absolutely required of the key rings and what can go on the key ring, perhaps by policies. Just simply putting it on the key ring is really not sufficient to get the intention of, say, the administrator or whoever built in the kernel. It's, it's not enough. And what was the second one? Oh, if we wanted to try to restrict uh, answering this question, how do we identify or restrict those certificates we don't want is we could exclude those with a path length of zero. Did I miss something? <laughs> Well, so you're in violent agreement. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's it. So corner us at break or somehow, or you have yeah, our email. Yeah, and we can kind of maybe plot a little bit and see how we can, we can realize this. Thanks. Thank you.